Hi everyone, welcome to this video. My name is T, if you're new here. I really do hope everyone's day is going well. I wonder if I'm gonna ever change that intro. I don't know, it's just so comfortable. Did you miss me? Don't even answer that, cause I know you did. I could imagine how your life was. It was boring, <sighs> sleep without me. So the queen is back, I'm back. Today we are here to talk about the power the man eaters, the femme fatales, and to inquire and explore how this power is typically constructed in TV and film, how that construction is typically perceived, and its paradoxical imitations in real life. Okay, okay, we're gonna vibe it. We're gonna really, really dig on it. I hope. I'd like to start by saying thank you to everyone who recommended the show, the hit show, Ginny and Georgia to me, because the character of Georgia Miller is quite the exemplar for today's topic at hand. So let's talk about that show for several moments. Firstly, spoiler alert. Let this be a blanket spoiler alert, please. If you ever see me talking about a movie or show, I am going to spoil it to some capacity. Just remember I said that. Ginny and Georgia is a Netflix original about a mother-daughter duo and Austin. Shout out to Austin. Is that not the cutest little boy you've ever seen in your life? Oh my God, he's so cute. After the mysterious death of Georgia's second husband, the trio moved to a new town with hopes that they can finally live a normal life free from the difficulty that seemingly follows them everywhere. Upon settling into their new home, the audience, as well as Georgia's children, begin to learn of her unsettling past and we see each character's evolution as more and more secrets unfold. Sounds good, right? This show was not great to me. And you know what? I trusted y'all. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why I haven't learned my lesson yet because this is the same shit y'all tried to pull with The Wilds. And you know, The Wilds was not a bad show, but I remember finishing it and thinking, what the f they want me to do with this? I was supposed to make a video out of that show? So Ginny and Georgia, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great. I felt like I didn't really get the point of the show as a whole. Are we running from Austin's dad? Are we falling back in love with Ginny's dad? Are we covering up a murder or three? Are we coming to terms with our racial identity? What, what the f is we doing? Also, there were a lot of intense and loaded topics that were just arbitrarily thrown in there, maybe for the sake of shock value, but not because it actually is a show that is loaded and intense and dynamic. And what's worse is they would talk about these things, well, not even talk about them, really just flash them on the screen with like the dark lighting and the eerie, suspenseful music. And then immediately after, they would juxtapose it with like this happy, upbeat scene like, one minute I felt like I was watching a show on HBO, the next I felt like I was watching a show on freaking Freeform. Like, where's the bridge? How do we connect? Take me there, you know what I mean? And that could very well be part of the genius to symbolize the polarity of Georgia's double life, but that specific execution just wasn't for me. I felt the show would have been so much better if they weren't speeding. I mean, sp foot on a gas, 200 on a dash, speeding through these very important and triggering topics and maybe just took their time. I remember hearing Kim Foster once say that it isn't filmmakers or writers job to make you feel good after presenting you with a trauma inducing or a wound opening topic. And I get that, I understand that, I even agree with that. But I do also feel it is the responsibility of writers to Basically, if you're gonna take it there, take it there. You get me, like don't half-ass it. It's one thing for writers to give me a heavy scene and I feel like shit afterwards because that's just how powerful the writing was and the acting was, but it's completely different for them to present me with these loaded topics and just go nowhere with it. They went nowhere with it. If you're gonna bring up body dysmorphia, take it there. If you're gonna bring up self-harm, Take it there and don't give me none of that, oh, we were just trying to introduce it and then it'll unfold more in season two. No, thank you. Because I was worried about them. And ultimately, I felt like the plot was really just an amalgamation of borrowed storylines that we've all seen like 20 minutes ago. The cool mom who's her daughter's BFF and encourages her daughter to tell her any and everything about her life, but has so many secrets and skeletons of her own, if her daughter were to find out the truth, she might literally run away. Where have we seen that before? The smart and attentive guy of color getting left for the cold and distant white guy with a slightly decent jawline. Where have we seen that before? <clears throat> and of course, the big trope of today's video, 
the femme fatale. The femme fatale is a woman who uses her sensuality and her underestimated intelligence and skill to deceive and devour men for reasons that range from materialism to vengeance or just because she felt like it. The femme fatale has been around for a very long time. She can be seen in Victorian writings and that later influenced the modern archetype that we're familiar with on screen. In early film noir, the femme fatale can be seen enticing a man with her beauty and using her charm to have him commit crimes on her behalf. In the past few decades, the femme fatale's beauty and sex appeal has shown to be so powerful, it manifests supernaturally. And more contemporarily, we've seen the femme fatale become much more humanized and multitudinous, showing us that she can devote just as much time to outsmarting and devouring men as she can to motherhood or her career. Okay, I love this trope. I really, really enjoy this trope. I really enjoy seeing women embody their sexuality. I'm not really too hype on the whole devouring men part. Yeah, it doesn't really do it for me. Contrary to popular belief, I don't particularly enjoy seeing men in pain, <laughs> but <laughs> I do love seeing women being strong and smart and, and sexy and all of that, all at once. That part does it for me. But I wouldn't be sitting here if that's all I had to say, yeah? So let's talk about my gripes with this trope. I have like three. Number one, it always somehow ends in defeat or submission. Most times, at least. She gets caught she dies or worse she falls in love but that's not the bad part she falls in love and she has to denounce her past promiscuity for what for what y'all know that video you little rodney son yes i'm little rodney son you talking about rodney with the fat ass butt yo why is you pot me yo my fault og no nah, ain't no my fault run your pockets yo for what don't kick them bitches out yo. for what no, matter of <laughs> and i think that's harmful because it's like these writers are trying to be on the whole female sexual liberation and confidence wave because that's what's in right now, right? Yet still denying the femme fatale the right to continue to exist as a sexual being post matrimony or post motherhood. And that's just not realistic. Georgia's character actually didn't do too bad with this, so I'll give them that. But you can see how the normality of this trope, of course, of course, coupled with misogyny, sexism, religious indoctrination, affects how we view women in society who make their sexuality a permanent element of their womanhood, regardless of age or marriage or anything. Why was I so close to the camera this whole time? Maybe we should relax. <laughs> One thing about me is I've actually never been relaxed ever. All right, second gripe I have with this trope, how stereotypically hyper-feminine and hypersexual presenting the femme fatale is. It's perfectly fine to be hyper-feminine, perfectly fine to be hypersexual. I live for you, I love that for you. Shit, I love that for me too, I've had my day. Oh gosh, if only y'all knew, if only y'all knew me in the five inch acrylics, six inch stilettos, 20 inch lace wig days, baby. Wow, what a moment I will never forget. A moment that is most pleasing to me in my career. But while that is an effective method to being a femme fatale, it's not the only one. You can dress like a tomboy. You can you can dress like a Ginny and still be a Georgia. There it is. Please know this. <laughs> if there, that is the one thing that you should never give up because if you know anything about how men operate, baby, you know. It does not always take a push-up bra and a mini skirt to have a man on his knees. I I don't wanna hear it. I'm only here to tell the truth. And if writers are seemingly taking a more modernized approach to this archetype by giving us the Olivia Popes and the Georgia Millers of the fictional world, well, let's enhance that by actually incorporating the world around us. And you know, since Ginny and Georgia is already in the hot seat, I guess I'll just go ahead and say they really dropped the ball on an opportunity to play a major role in revolutionizing this trope. Not saying that was their job, I'm just saying they missed out on a great opportune. You see the end of the first episode where Ginny makes a power move on Marcus and she walks up to him and pretends like she gonna tell his girl that they fucked. The way they could have shown us that Jenny is in fact a femme fatale just like her mama, maybe even worse, she's just using different tactics than we're used to seeing, wow, I would have lived. Because we already have a problem with Hollywood demonizing femininity, shout out to Shan Spear, awesome, awesome video on it. Hollywood created the prototype of the ultra feminine mean girl and vilified her so much, played the f 
out of her so much that the not like other girls trope was born out of it. The way they could have checkmated both of those cliches and said, yeah, female sexuality can be poisonous. It can be weaponized, even if it ain't dressed in pink. I, I would have loved I'm just saying though, let's move on. And lastly, final gripe number three, I don't like that these women are seen ultimately as powerful, seen ultimately as conquerors, but this power must be acquired through a man. It's giving very wolf in sheep's clothing, the way they slid that in there. It's often said that the femme fatale is the opposite of the damsel in distress, but a 2019 article I found on Apollo Pad states, think of the femme fatale as a mirror image of the damsel. Both are a reductive and sexist way of looking at femininity. Both seek to minimize and undermine a woman's personal power and complexity of character. I like 85% agree. You see, the real reason why the femme fatale is the way she is and has what she has is because she's fucking smart. And you know what show did a really good job of showing us that the femme fatale and the damsel in distress is really the same person? True Blood. No, I'm not done talking about it. Ever since the last video, shout out to True Blood Hive, by the way. I did not know y'all was rolling so deep. It was really only like eight of y'all, but still. Anyway, I started to miss the show, so I went back and rewatched some of it, and I was really paying attention to Sookie. Fucking Sookie. Fucking Sookie. Fucking Sookie. Fucking Sookie. As usual, she's in the goddamn way. So she's this damsel in distress. She always needs saving. She always needs protection. Trouble just seems to follow little Miss Sookie Stackhouse everywhere she goes, right? And you know, I'm sure that must have been terrifying for the bitch, but she didn't have to worry about shit else in life because every vampire, werewolf, in fairy, every supernatural being with an enormous amount of power that stepped foot into that little racist town, she was fucking a all of them, all, all of them. Oh, mm. <sighs> today's lip combo is a is a madness. Honestly, why do I have so much? Wow, one, two, buckle my shoe. No one in the corner has swagger like I do. What? Hold on. What do y'all know about that? What do y'all young barbs, y'all barbs born after two thousand, know about that? That's not even Nicki Minaj. That's that's Nicki Lewinsky. That's Nicki the Ninja. Nicki the Howard just y'all don't know nothing about it. Uh Suki. Um, so it's like while she could not defend herself against anything at all, <laughs> and she definitely needed these men way more than they needed her, they was all ready to die about that person. Kill yourselves and she walks free. Both of you. I accept. Fine. What? what? And she knew. And that is the bridge between the damsel in distress and the femme fatale. Awareness of her power and what she chooses to do with it. Because both of them are being favored for their beauty. Both of them are requesting the power and assistance or protection of a man and will eventually repay him sexually. Both of them will do that. But one of them is saying, please, please. And the other one is saying, run them pockets right now. Make his pockets <laughs> do 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 do. Suki said both. It really just depended on the day. You know what? Suki growing on me. I've changed. As you can see, I am equal parts critical as I am excited and entertained by this trope. Very two-faced, very torn. But that's perfectly okay to be because this is fiction. Ultimately, it's a fantasy, and it doesn't thrive in real life. Majority of tropes do not. And that's pretty much where the video would end if all of this stayed in a fantastical world. But, I know a lot of buts today, right? Time and time again, we prove it to be true that life imitates art. And we can all observe firsthand how consumers, particularly women, try to push this archetype onto real life people in the name of girl power and female solidarity, but eventually become the Judas become the Brutus and betray these women they once painted as heroines. <laughs> Let's take it back to my three gripes. Number one, for a majority of the story, a femme fatale is winning at a rigged game that was always meant for her to lose, so she outsmarts the game, yet somehow, miraculously, she always ends up defeated by some inconsequential thing. I cannot dive into this subtopic without bringing up Corinne Steffens. For those who don't know, Corinne Steffens is 
the blueprint. She was one of, if not the most popular video vixen of the 2000s. And in 2006, she wrote an autobiography called Confessions of a Video Vixen. And that book flew straight to the top of the New York Times bestseller list because the flavor. She was dropping names, so many names and so many juicy stories attached to those names. Now that's a real life femme fatale, if I've ever seen one, honestly, like to a T. She has, <laughs> it might seem just a little bit more giddy than normal. It's been a long time and I shouldn't have left you. I'm just very excited today. Okay, she has it down to a T. Right, she has the shitty trauma and abuse ridden origin story. She has the rough upbringing, pregnant at a young age, homeless. Then she has the realization of her beauty and her sex appeal. And she meets a couple rich and powerful men in the industry and boom, her life skyrockets. That is the quintessential femme fatale story, but in real life. And she was open enough to share that in a book, but what did she get for it? Shit absolute shit and all she was doing was telling the truth i mean i was only like six or seven when that book came out and even i remember how terribly the media was treating her and it's so weird because i remember not being able to go into a hair salon or a nail shop without seeing every black woman in there with this book in her hand and her face deep in the page wait Of course I opened to this page. She looks amazing here. It has pictures. She's so beautiful, wow. But I also remember her going on the Tyra Banks show and being pretty much scolded by Tyra and her mainly female audience. I remember Tyra and the audience seeming offended that Corinne wasn't ashamed of herself. So do you think that you wrote this book because of revenge, out of revenge? No, see, revenge is something that happens when people are miserable and upset and and so weren't bitter. you miserable and upset not when and bitter? Why make names? People. If there's no anger, why, why name not? Why not? It's just the truth. And when I went back and read the book as an adult, I was like, what is the problem? I genuinely could not find it. Again, paradoxical praise up to an undefined point. You see, y'all was with her when she was in your favorite music videos dancing next to your favorite rappers. Y'all was with her when you were studying those music videos, trying to emulate the way she danced and the way she dressed because you saw the way men responded to her. Y'all were fans. Y'all were real life Corinne Stephan superhead. That's what they used to call her, oh my gosh. Y'all were superhead fans at first and then somewhere along the line when she reached a certain level of success a level of success that was no longer relatable to you you started to view her as the enemy interesting indeed but we'll come back to that and then my second gripe was that the femme fatale is always reduced to a certain look in fiction it's the hyper feminized look and in real life especially amongst black women it manifests in very colorist and fat phobic ways lizzo constantly posting in lingerie is doing too much but anybody else and it's just to upkeep a seductive image. Each and every last one of us can probably scroll on our Instagram Explore page right now and see at least five influencers, IG models, YouTubers doing a hashtag ad for Savage X Fenty. But when Lizzo... D Is that right? It's, we gonna kill it because y'all know how I get about Lizzo. It's fine. And then Lori Harvey. Lord have mercy, are y'all invested? Lord have mercy, do y'all care to a very weird extent about who this lady is f***ing? Anyway, y'all push the femme fatale archetype onto her every single day. But you know who else is out here lining up these athletes and living her absolute best life? Simone Biles. Have you seen the roster? Baby, look at the material. Why are we not talking about her too? Why are we not obsessed with her too? I wonder. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll come to me later. And my final gripe was that the femme fatale success is always contingent on a man. Okay, <laughs> my big bad boy theory on that is that is the straw that breaks the camel's back every single time. Because y'all see these women climbing these ladders via their appeal, and it's initially perceived as them reclaiming the power that was taken from them. We view it as such when we see men surrender and submit to their seduction, but when they get to the top, and other women are still at the bottom. Now the realization is, ugh, she only up there because she spent her whole life making men happy and horny. Ew, look at her wanting to be openly desired by men. Ugh, look at her trying to impress men. What? Yeah. 
this is where <laughs> this is where the mean girl feminism comes in kim foster did an awesome video on this centered on aisha curry also logan michon she did a great video as well hers was centered on megan fox if i were to do a video on it mine would be centered on amber rose there's dozens of people you could choose from but the underlying theme is the same women who claim to be feminists the same women who be like, yeah, girl, get that bread, get that head, then leave. Eventually end up ostracizing the women who actually do it. But wait, because this is the part where the mean girl feminists want my head chopped clean off. Because I know, I know what Audre Lord said. I know that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And in this specific context, I know that the beauty hierarchy only continues to survive if women continue to climb it and strive to be at the top. I understand that the top only holds a few seats and each and every one of them seats has an expiration date. So it really is an eat or be eaten system. I understand that in order for us all to win, the only solution is for the system to be eradicated as a whole. I know. But what I'm saying is, if you're gonna be about that, start there and end there. My issue is not with the women who start there and end there because y'all do be making sense, for real. You be having me sometimes. My issue is with the women who were encouraging it all along and then switched up out of envy because I feel you were using them to fulfill objectives that you were too scared to accomplish yourself. You see, y'all want these women to be your crusaders. You want them to be your Trojan horses for sexual prowess and liberation. You want the Amber Roses of the world to say, yeah, I'm a slut, and what about it? Let's, let's hold hands, let's march together, let's stand in solidarity against sexual suppression. You want the Lori Harveys of the world to say, yeah, I dated him and him and him, and I'm probably gonna date him and him and him, and you're just gonna have to get over it. Y'all want these women to be your figureheads and bear the weight and the criticism of trying to normalize things that should have never been stigmatized in the first place. But when that's actually accomplished, and they're rewarded for it, you betray them. As soon as you realize that they have more power than you, they're getting chosen over you, they're getting favored more than you, they're getting paid more than you, again, not because they're the enemy, but because that's just how the system is set up, then you turn on them and you perpetuate the same bigotry, you speak to and about them with the same reductive language and belittling tones that men would, not even realizing that you propped them up to be that in the first place. And by projecting your own internalized misogyny onto these women, you become the same demot, the same destruction that we see in the movies. Et tu brute, you are now the oppressor. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. That's why I said all my bitches is phony. A whole bunch of fucking 40 ass bitches. <sighs> and that's that shit I don't like. I feel like if we are going to try to imitate and emulate the femme fatale archetype in real life and encourage women to do so if they so please, then actually let women do so if they so please. Again, I'm not talking to or about the people who think this stuff is wrong to begin with and don't support it in the first place. Y'all are really not part of this conversation. I'm talking to you. If it don't apply, let it fly. But if it does apply, don't encourage it halfway and then drop off your support somewhere at the end because you got a little jealous. Long story short, leave Lori Harvey alone because y'all are setting her up for failure. I see it happening already. Leave Amber Rose alone because we all wanted a ticket to that slut walk a couple years ago. Apologize to Megan Fox. She did not deserve what she went through. Apologize to Corinne Steffens because neither did she. And beyond that, uh, I don't really have a solution just yet. I just know it's weird and I wanted to bring it up. I came to start shit. I was bored, so I ruined lunch purposely and I had fun doing it. Thank you all so much for watching, especially if you made it all the way to the end of the video. Let me reiterate that I don't think Ginny and Georgia is a bad show. It's still a decent show. It's just grouped in with like the love victors and the secret life of the American teenagers of the world, you know? So it's doing it for somebody. I mean, it was number one on Netflix's top 10 for like two weeks straight. It's doing it for a lot of somebodies, clearly. Just not for me. Just not for me. Be sure to leave your thoughts and your comments down below. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, however you're feeling today, and subscribe for more content. I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.